everybody and a very warm welcome along to Real Israel and to our third edition of what the uh, Israeli uh, papers say. Now my name is Paul Alster, I'm a broadcaster journalist based here in Israel and each week we'll be striving to bring you a sense of the real Israel as reported by the local media here and judged through the eyes of Israeli journalists, activists and campaigners from a wide variety of political viewpoints. Now, we're not trying to sell you a rose-tinted uh, image of Israel, but then again, we're not here to be Israel bashing. We're here to play it straight down the middle, hearing views from different people who have genuine uh, love and affection for Israel, but they want to see the country progress in the right direction. Now, I'm delighted to say that my two guest news reviewers this week are Boaz Corporal and Rami Lador. Boaz Korpel, a very familiar face and voice to loads of people in Israel. He has a, a number of uh, television shows and he of course is well known as an expert in uh, motorsport and in the world of motoring and his automotive world is a top show on Israeli television. As well as being an expert on motorsport, uh, Boaz also commentates on the MMA and on the slightly less aggressive uh, sport of snooker. Uh, amongst others. So, Boaz, great to have you with us. Thank you very much, and I'm considering taking you as my presenter because you did it the best way ever. Well, it had to happen once. Uh, <laughs> and also, also with us is Rami Lador. Now, Rami Lador had a very distinguished career in the banking industry, and he was the executive vice president of the international division of Bank Hapoelim in Southeast Asia in territories such as Hong Kong and Singapore. And he was also involved representing Bank Hapoelim in the United States in Philadelphia, uh, San Francisco, and also in New York. Now, he's meant to be retired and having a quiet life, but he uh, recently has joined the managing committee of the movement for quality government in Israel, which is one of the organizations leading the demonstrations against the Netanyahu Gantz unity government that is in power at the moment. Uh, Rami is also the brother of the former state prosecutor Moshe Lador, who was uh, very instrumental in the successful charging and prosecution of the former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. So Rami, very nice of you to come out of retirement to join us. Thank you very much. We're not against uh, government, we're against corruption. Absolutely. Well, we'll get into that in a moment. In fact, we're going to get into our first uh, topic here because like everywhere else in the world, Israel is having to deal with the coronavirus and having done very well first time round or appeared to do very well, uh, things have not been so good this time. We're into the second wave, uh, we're into a lockdown and we have one of the highest infection rates in the world per capita, unfortunately. Now, one of the highest levels of infection is among the ultra-Orthodox religious Jewish community, which represents only about 12% of the actual population, but is occupying, uh, by some reports, over 50% of the hospital beds, and this is causing a number of issues. Now, in a very interesting piece on the Times of Israel, a very uh, well-known character here in Israel, and a very important man, Yehudi Meshi Zahav, he is the founder of an organization called Zaka, which is a, a religious Jewish organization that has a hospital service and a medical service. And he has been very critical this week of his own ultra-Orthodox population. We'll come to some of the things he had to say in a moment. But first, Boaz, obviously you're aware of the situation. What's your view of uh, the way that the ultra-Orthodox communities are being singled out as being uh, primarily responsible for the spread of the infections? First of all, the reaction, the first reaction is uh, like everybody else said, sadness. It's sad that uh, people are getting sick, it's sad that people are getting contagious and uh, other people in the, in the families, in the neighborhoods, in, in, in the synagogues, uh, every, every other place getting this uh, coronavirus virus as well. And uh, the, the, the big question is why? why you find it more and more in their population than in other different populations like the not the orthodox people or the, the free people and uh, there are several reasons because we need to we need to know that the religious orthodox people they are not coming from one mainstream they are divided to to a few streams 
and each stream of, of uh, religious people, they kind of have their own rabbi, or they say in Israeli, uh, uh, it's a big rabbi, or chief rabbi, and this chief rabbi has his own philosophy about life, about the way of uh, conserving all the religious life in, in his community, and they, they try to preserve their own communities as much as they can. Yes. In the... In the in a way, I can, let's say, I can maybe say they are like the Amish in America. They're trying to disconnect from, from what can go inside and corrupt them. For example, internet, smartphones, television, things like that. And they're trying to only to, to, to deal with one thing, learning the Bible and things like that. So they go to the rabbi and each and every rabbi have his own way of thinking. And he is the one that needs to be convinced by the government that the right measures to do is to stay away from each other and things like that in order to take down the numbers of the people that are getting the coronavirus. And, okay, uh, well, just, just, just to come in there, just for a moment, before I go to Rami, just for a view on this, are you suggesting, Boaz, just listening to what you say, that maybe while the rabbis might not have been directing their followers as well as they should in some cases, that the government has actually been uh, at fault for not um, educating and communicating well enough with the religious community. Absolutely correct. Because if you see what happened, if you saw what happened in the first wave, as we call it on March and April and maybe even May, the army was inside. They they forced them to go to lockdown, uh, but at the same time they support them and open them to other opinions. And they met the people and the rabbis, and then they cooperated, and the numbers were, were very low over there compared to what we have now. The government failed, in, in my eyes, with the way that they should act directly on the rabbis and give them a good, 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 uh, a, a, let's say, uh, proce procedure of tell them what to do and how to instruct their own communities in order to stop all these contagious chains, uh, what they call them here, oh. with the coronavirus. So this, that was the problem. Okay, Rami, you heard what Boaz had to say. Would you agree with that, or do you think um, the government have a part to play, but that the uh, ultra-Orthodox have not really played their part as they should? Objectively speaking, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, they have a different uh, challenge facing the corona, because they're in congested neighborhoods, and sometimes their families are, in, instead of two, four people of other Israelis, they're probably 10, maybe 12 people in one family in small apartments. So the very spreading of the coronavirus is probably much easier in their uh, quarters than in uh, the village that I live at. And uh, that's one issue, how do you deal with that? How do you do quarantines there? Because the quarantine will not get rid of the, because people will continue to affect each other. And what they did in the first round, they were very fast, very excited about opening hotels for those who are infected and separate them as fast as possible. Right now, I think part of the Orthodox community, the ultra Orthodox, they are thinking of doing the herd treatment meaning that if all the boys in yeshiva will get uh, ill, then eventually will somehow uh, solve the issue. It will be contained and uh, not, uh, not spread uh, further than it needs to be spread. I say that it's very objective and they have a problem. However, the rest of Israel also has a problem because of their conditions of living, we do not want to be uh, affected. We want to be green, not red. Red is where you have all the uh, containments all and all the restrictions. Yeah. All the restrictions and uh, it creates a problem because there's a lot of sensitivity as is, even without corona, between the ultra-Orthodox communities and the secular communities as far as their purpose in their daily life, their uh, studies of Torah, their serving in the army and the regular community who has a different set of the livelihood the criteria. So it, it's a problem that I don't know how it's going to be solved. So far, like uh, it was mentioned, it's negotiation between the government who actually are asking the head of the Rebbe's or the Admors 
to please consider what we suggest. It's not like we, the regular, the Chiloni, the secular Israelis, are being told what we can or cannot do in or out of quarantine. Netanyahu actually calls the Admolim, the heads of the Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, and request them to please, please abide. And one more point, this Monday, Israel might reopen the kindergartens up to the age of three or six. Uh, the ultra-Orthodox already told that it's going to be a very, very difficult day if we don't open to all the yeshivas. The rest of okay, the schools so are going to open the 1st of January. So there's yeah. issues here. There are issues here. It sounds almost as if there's a veiled threat there. But just before I come back to Boaz for a final word on this first subject, I want to quote you what uh, the other Meshi Zahab of Zaka, remember he's the ultra-Orthodox guy who set up a medical service that is highly lauded for all areas of Israeli society, a very religious man who's got a very interesting and colourful background, to say the very least. This is what he said uh, to the Times of Israel, and I'll quote you. He said, talking about the uh, Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox that he deals with on a daily basis, he says, I explain to people that others are looking at them and saying that we're in this situation because of the Haredim and that the 12% is infecting the 80 plus percent and that, quote, you are stealing the breathing machines. And I say that this hatred is terrible, but what people see is the continuation of singing, dancing, public prayers and simcha celebrations as well as a continuation of the protests by the Haredim against the authorities. Boaz, just to come back, there's, it looks like there needs to be some responsibility taken on all sides here, and so we don't get into a really, really desperate situation. Listen, we can speak about it for hours, but uh, we don't have the time. And uh, what I can say is, is very simple. Uh, in different way, from me, you, and uh, Mr. Lado are doing for the home, for our own families and for ourselves, they are not doing the same. They're listening only to the rabbi. We need, the government need to act directly and as strong as possible uh, with those rabbis in order not to ask them. Because as Mr. Lador said, Bibi Netanyahu called one of them and he told, told him, Shana Tova, thank you very much, thank you very much. He didn't, uh, didn't understand this rabbi is 96 years old. What can you say to 96 years old rabbi with all due respect and a lot of respect to this rabbi and all the others, of course. You need to take the community, you need to, uh, to, to teach them what to do and to let them know that they have to do it right now. Look what's happening in their communities in New York, okay? I'm not speaking about free, uh, free people, let's, let's speak only about religious people. They, they're dying in dozens in New York, okay? Which yes. is a lot more free country than Israel. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand. They don't understand it. This, the so it's a communication issue. It really is a communication yeah. issue that lies at the heart of the problem. Exactly. Well, the way things are going, this is a story uh, that is going to be revisited time and again, but uh, kind of related to this because, of course, the issues with the coronavirus and the way it's being handled have been uh, a catalyst for protests against uh, the government. But not just that, there's all sorts of other questions, and we've got Rami Lador with us here, who's have been leading protests uh, in his local area. Uh, Rami, just explain to us, what are the issues that people are getting out on the streets of all the towns and villages in Israel at the moment and protesting about? What bothers them most about the current situation? Well, first of all, I think Israelis are always good at complaining. We're good at it. And uh, right now, uh, we're certainly getting a lot of uh, good uh, data to work on if we want to complain. But seriously, uh, we have a, a government led by a prime minister that's been there since 2009, who's now been uh, indicted with the corruption issues, such as uh, uh, bribery, a uh, breach of the uh, faith, and uh, lying. And uh, people generally do not trust uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, at least half the people. The last election, the last three elections, had one issue, which was the main issue, not the Israeli-Arab conflict, not the, the economy, not even the coronavirus, when you 
or a health issues or education issue. There was one side that says only BB, only BB Netanyahu, and the other side, anything but BB, just not BB. That was the real issue in the last three campaigns. Israel for one year could not decide who is, could not decide in its election who is going to be the government. None of the parties were able to uh, uh, put together a coalition. But, but, end, Rami, but Rami, just one question. That that was then, and this is now. What has changed since then and to now that all of a sudden, all of a sudden, in the last few months, the protests have grown so much. What has made that difference? That's a great question. It puts me back into focus because we never got to a this clear decision. The Israel democracy did not make a clear decision as to yes, BB, or absolutely not BB. And then, in the last election, a small part, not small part, the blue and white party joined BB saying, we can't go for another election. That's just too hard for the country. The country cannot take it, not economically, not... Uh, not uh, not socially, socially yeah. you cannot take another election. Therefore, we're going to take a step backwards. We're going to forgive for the time being or let go of the charges against Bibi Netanyahu and we're going to let him be prime minister in at least a rotational uh, system. The rotation system is not working. We have 52 uh, ministers and deputy ministers in the government. All of them under a government that's uh, headed by someone who is charged with corruption. And me as one cannot take it. And we're going to the streets and saying, well, this cannot happen. It cannot happen to our country. What do we tell our children? One one issue, because I know there's a lot of things that I can uh, jump in and okay. solve. For, but one issue is that in Israel, if you're in, not indicted with an offense that is a uh, criminal, you cannot serve as a minister, you cannot serve as a guard in a school, and you cannot serve as a prime minister's driver. There is some lacoon in the Israeli law which actually lets someone that's indicted to continue his term as prime minister, and that lacoon, sort of the unclear, was uh, set in front of the High Court of Justice, and they said Bibi Netanyahu can be prime minister. So, okay. We have a prime minister that cannot be his own driver because he's not uh, honest enough, according to the Israeli uh, law legal system. Okay, so he, uh, in your view, he's not honest enough to even drive his own car, but he's still there as prime minister. Boaz, your take on why the people are out on the streets and whether it's going to make a difference? Um, the other question, uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure, I don't know. But uh, for your first question, uh, the answer is very simple and very short. Uh, because of the reaction of Bibi Netanyahu and his men, uh, and his people. Bibi Netanyahu reacted to those uh, protests as people that are uh, anarchist and they are trying to take, uh, to, to take, to, to steal, not to take, to steal uh, the prime minister uh, job from him and things like that. And they go on and say it again and again and again and again. And if in, the, in, if in the beginning there were 100,000 people that uh, protest all over the country, now there are half a million because he accused them. And because he accused them, they want to show him back that his accusations are not true. And if you want to stop them in his area of living in Balfour Street in, in Jerusalem, then they will pop up all over the country. And that's what's going on. And then he tried to block them under siege and to, to stop them because of the coronavirus is contagious, not like in the rabbis or in the uh, religious people, uh, what is done over there. There's, there's no similarity to, to, to the policing of uh, people in the religious area and the free area. So he tried to stop them, not come to his uh, own neighborhood in Jerusalem to protest. And they said, okay, if you stop us there, we'll, we'll show up all over the country. And they're coming more and more and more and more. And to your other question, if this will change the map or something like that, unfortunately, to my eyes, we're still there. We're still on the rock. We, we, we cannot decide. The, the, the people is divided by half to left and right. And uh, until him going to give back the keys and say, thank you very much, I'm going to retire, take my wife and go to the Bahamas, uh, the situation will go, is going to stay the same. Well, that, 
Uh, uh, your, I, I, just just before I come back to Rami for a, a, a one more word on this, the there has been some very good reporting across all the media uh, from all different angles, left, right, and centre. But one of the best stories uh, that I've seen reported on this is a piece in a very good. Uh, uh, investigative journalism website, which is available in English and Hebrew. In English, it's called uh, hashamrim.org. Uh, and they had a piece uh, titled Brute Force on Balfour Street, which was talking about the way the policing, um, some people believe it has been heavy handed the way they've dealt with things and not uh, appropriate. They also had a terrific uh, photo image of uh, some of the protesters being uh, um, subdued. Uh, by the police, and that's an article that's well worth uh, taking a look at. But uh, just to come back to Rami Lador, uh, Boas feeling that it's really not going to change things, but you're out there banging the drums, standing on bridges, seeing all the traffic going by, tooting their horns. Is it going to make such a difference? Is BB going to step down, or are we just going to be stuck in this terrible uh, circle and cycle of uh, non-governments, as, as many people see it, and the protests and the illness for so long? That's a great question, and it's a question that I ask myself two or three times a day when I find myself in an activity that is actually demonstrating against Netanyahu. And I finally got to a good answer, and now I have to change it. My good answer was this, does it do good? And my answer, all, like only two or three weeks ago, yes, it does good. It does good to me, because I feel better about myself as a citizen that I'm not sitting home watching TV and getting aggravated. I'm going out and doing something. If I'm, uh, Does it convince anyone from the other side? I'm never able to convince anybody with my logic or Nobody's able to convince me with this logic. So apparently I'm not going to convince BB supporters that BB is not fit to be prime minister. However, there are a lot of indications, I think Boaz referred to this, that BB Netanyahu himself is taking these demonstrations very seriously. There have been some studies that say if you can get 2 or 3 percent of the population of the country, that is 300, 250, 300,000 people to a demonstration, then it's a point of no return. And if we can get to those numbers, Bibi will step out. And uh, actually, uh, Bibi himself told Eud Ulmelt in uh, 1997, I believe, uh, when a prime minister is suspected of so many uh, ill crimes, he should step out and clear his name because he cannot there's at least enough suspicion that he cannot lead the country with a clear mind and make his decisions according to what's best for the country. That's a, a translation of what Bibi Netanyahu himself said to Ulmer when he was prime minister. Uh, will it help? I believe at the end of the day, uh, it will help. Today, this very day, the Israeli high court is supposed to uh, get the answers from the government from the uh, Attorney General, if Israel is going to investigate or not investigate the biggest uh, charge that has not been investigated yet, and that is all that has to do with the sub sophisticated submarines that Germany sold to Israel and to yeah. Egypt with Israel's approval. Well, we'll, we'll wait to see what, what, what comes out of that. One more thing, please. Uh, unfortunately, yes, yeah. unfortunately, I have to stick strongly with my opinion uh, because the only solution that will solve this problem, this blockade problem, is when we find a new star. Uh, when a new star will come, and some people say, thought in, in the past that uh, Mr. Benny Gantz can be this one, but when we find a new star that can lead us, then the, 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 the people will follow him. There is no leader. There is no leader in Israel. I'm sorry to say that there is no leader. We're going back to the days of Moses and the people of Israel that came out of Egypt. There is no leader in Israel. The new name that's rising up now, it's not a leader, it's Mr. Bennett. He's, he's a good man. He thinks only positive for Israel. He's working for the, for the, for the people and fighting the, the coronavirus. And he's, he's done a lot of good things in the past and having very good ideas about the future. But he is the answer that people want to punish Mr. Netanyahu and vote for him as a punishment. Not because look what happened in the last election. He, he clearly was out of the of the of the business and out of the game at all. And he yes. put him back inside. Yeah. And now he's he's the savior. No, he cannot be the savior. He's only a partial and very very um, 
short-time solution. We need a leader and we don't have one. Well, uh, that is interesting and I'm sure a lot of people will, uh, certainly a lot of people watching on from abroad, people who see Bibi Netanyahu, see him as this very sort of smooth statement, very good talker in English, I they're not always aware. I wish the best, I wish you all the best. In the bed, yeah. Yeah. But they they're not always aware, yeah, they're not always aware of what's going on internally within Israel and how these struggles are. For, you say we're looking for a star. I remember with Margaret Thatcher, they said there could never be anybody to lead the Conservative Party after Margaret Thatcher. They said after Tony Blair, you know, there's a reason why you have two term presidents in as a maximum in the United States. You know, maybe that's something that should be brought in here. But at the moment, he still is the star and he's not yet a fallen star. So we'll have to wait and see. We'll talk about BB and the submarines and all the other uh, aspects of the protests and everything else. Um, going forward, but I want to move on because our time is limited, and it's great to have Boaz here with oh, us because one, he. One short comment. One short comment. Bibi very Netanyahu. Quickly. Very quickly, Bibi Netanyahu was said on a TV program, uh, Dan Shilon program, about 12 years ago, that he's going to only run for two terms, eight years, because he said whatever you cannot do in two terms, you're not going to do after that. That he's okay. on record saying. Well, that's fair enough. Maybe such, maybe such as maybe such as Erdogan and Putin uh, should uh, sing from that same uh, hymn sheet because they they book themselves in for another two decades by the looks of it. We want um, Messiah, and we want him now. Yeah. Well, the only thing that's coming to Israel at the moment, by the looks of things, is not the Messiah, as far as I'm aware. But it's good to have uh, Boaz with us because a very interesting story uh, from the Globes. Uh, newspaper here in Israel, a very uh, serious newspaper. It relates to the world of motoring. Now, we've got Israel's foremost expert on uh, motor cars and on the world of motoring and such, Boaz Kolbel with us. And the story, Boaz, is about the Chinese. Now, the Chinese um, are developing electric cars and they've set their sights on Israel. And I want you to tell me why they're interested in Israel and what they propose to do here. Yes, it's very interesting uh, story because uh, one would think that uh, Israel is uh, one of the biggest markets in Europe or in the Middle East because the answer is absolutely no. Uh, so what the Chinese can find here, except of the, you know, the high-tech nation that we yeah. have here and with all the solutions, for that they don't have to sell cars. They can open labs and, and use the Israeli uh, uh, good ideas and all the engineering and everything else and take it, take it home and use it for their own benefits. Yeah. But they're coming here not to do business uh, like they do in other countries. They're coming here as a bridge to the West. Um, electric cars, um, let's go back and one, one step uh, before. Uh, in 1st of January 2021, a new regulation is going to apply all over Europe. Uh, it, it's about pollutions. Uh, and uh, all the uh, car companies uh, will have to go down to 95 grams of pollution uh, as an average from the fleet of the cars that they are selling. Okay, they can sell a lot, a lot of cars in the variety, some of them polluting, some of them less. And the, the average need to go down to 95 grams. If it will be a, a above 95 grams, they will pay a fee, and the fee can go to uh, annually from all the manufacturers to something like 40 billion euro per year, 40 billion euro. And car companies that don't want to do it, so they start to to uh, to do some uh, uh, contracts with other companies and selling their cars or representing their cars in order to take down this level of, of pollution like the Fiat Chrysler is doing with Tesla in Europe. And suddenly you see Tesla by Fiat. No, it's not Tesla by Fiat. They're just working together to take down the level of the uh, pollution. So the Chinese are aiming to Europe and they know that Europe is going to be a big market for electric cars. And uh, Israel, since it's a close it's a close uh, country. Of the course, small country. The it's, close small. Yeah. it's not only small, it's close. We, you cannot go here from here to anywhere. You cannot cross to uh, Jordan and go from Jordan to some place. You cannot cross to Syria. You cannot cross to Lebanon. You cannot cross the Sinai from, to, to go to Egypt. That, that's it. You can go to the sea if you want to. But electric cars in the sea, they don't work. So they, they <laughs> use us 
they, they use us as a lab, and they know, and I, I, I will quote Mr. Lador, uh, one of the sentences from uh, the beginning of the show, saying that the Israeli people know because of their stubborn so much, and, and they know that we are a tough customers, and they know that if you, if you uh, take a car and you give it to an Israeli driver, you get all the rejects that you need to sell them in other countries, to learn in, all, in order to sell them and uh, to, to, uh, to make them better and to sell them in other countries. Yeah. So this is the way they use us, use and I say, you know what I mean? This is kind of a, as a kind of a laboratory, a testing pad to see how, how the product is received and what are the complaints and the catches and all the rest of it. The Israelis will tell the Chinese better than anybody else. Better than anybody else. And since we are not America, Africa, Australia or Europe and uh, uh, the traveling here is limited to a few hundred kilometers per day maximum, ask yourself, uh, guys, when you go out more, and not in this uh, lockdown situation, when you go out more than 100 kilometers every day, no. You do it maybe once a week when you go to visit your grandmother someplace. So it's, it's a very, very, uh, as you said, Paul, a lab, a very uh, uh, meticulous one, and they can learn a lot from us, and we can enjoy from that as well, and they can deliver the pollution here in Israel down and get electric car cheaper. Okay, well, Rami, I know that you bought a new car recently. We spoke about that. You bought a new car recently. I don't, I don't think it's an electric one. Congratulations, but, Rami. <laughs> but would you be persuaded? Would you be persuaded to buy a Chinese electric car if it was offered to you at the right price? Even if it wasn't offered at the right price, because I believe in Chinese products. <laughs> and uh, the car I bought, I really checked with boss before. It's okay. It's not the best, but it's okay. Okay. So and and as and as far as this plan, the, the Chinese, of course, are having a very um, a very big effect on our way of life here in, in Israel. The, the Chinese not only involved in this project to bring the cars, but they're also involved in huge civil engineering projects. There's also been the big controversy about the Chinese. Uh, running the port of Haifa, and because of that, the American Navy won't come into the port anymore. Uh, I'll put this to both of you. Any concerns about technology issues, about information of the Chinese looking in, like the Huawei scandal that there was in Britain that stopped them using Huawei for the 5G? Uh, any aspects of that that concern you? As long as Donald Trump will be, in, uh, will be uh, the president of America or Donald Trump's uh, party will be uh, in charge in, in the United States, then uh, they, will, they will try to not make us and the Chinese too much friendly with each other in order that we can exchange technologies uh, in this way. Listen, the, I don't know if you ate your cottage this morning or your, uh, uh, or your yogurt this morning, even if it's coming from Nuva. You I should know that. Yeah. Higher complex, man. So if yeah. you drink it with, if you ate it with your milk and in the milk yeah. is coming Nuva, so yeah. you better know that Nuva belongs to the Chinese. And uh, you don't need to look far away. Look at Portugal. Portugal, I don't want to say, you know, totally, but Portugal now owned by the Chinese. Everything in Portugal, in Lisbon, for example, owned by the Chinese. The airport, the government, the, not the government, sorry, the, the, the big companies over there, it's owned by Chinese business people. So, so we should have nothing to fear because we're already halfway there and uh, uh, the Chinese are already heavily involved in our lives even if we don't not aware of it directly. I can, I can see people uh, listen or look at us and say, come on, buy me, but uh, I'm not all one of them. Okay, Rami, anything to add? Yeah, you asked whether I'll trust a, a Chinese-made car and from the early 90s when we lived a few years in Hong Kong, uh, I was amazed by how serious the Chinese people took Israel. They thought they have a lot to learn from Israel, they had open minds, they wanted to know everything we know. Within the years, now we're in 2020, they not only learned, they picked up anything they needed to pick up to come up to par, but they are now leading so many industries and uh, there is a global threat which we won't get into and I'm not an expert on, but I totally, totally trust that they're doing a good job in whatever they do, from the buildings and their cities, from uh, the airplanes they're making and the cars they're making, and the Made in China label, which was not the best uh, a few years ago, no, it's uh, probably pretty good now, 
And uh, I think uh, we have uh, a lot to learn from them. And uh, let, me remind, let, me us. You, let me remind you that uh, all the ch channel of the uh, underground uh, train in, in the Middle East runs by, uh, built by Chinese company. Okay? And, and, and just, one, just one point, Boaz, because Israeli technology is used in so many cars around the world, um, safety technology and other things. Is that technology going to be incorporated, do you know, into the electric cars that are going to be sold here by the Chinese back to the Israelis? The, uh, the issue is that uh, most of the cars that are being produced in China are a joint venture with other companies. Japanese companies, American companies, European companies, and it's because of business uh, business benefits. I mean, Volkswagen uh, wouldn't give them free those uh, the, the, the technology that they have on Nissan or Honda or whatever, uh, but uh, they bringing to China the technology. And the Chinese are not copying, but you know, manufacturing and selling uh, uh, sell everything for their own market. They sell in China 30 million cars, new cars every year. For the whole world, they sell, the, the traffic is something around 90 million per year, third of that only to China. And now India is in the line with a few dozen millions as well per year. So yes. they're not so interested, I believe, in the technology because they have the technology from this point of view that the, the other companies are bringing them free, the company, the, the technology, and they need only to manufacture. When they develop their own products, and some of them are Chinese electric car, then they will not have the, the then they will be limited to, to, to the access of the uh, European technology, and then they will go to the Israelis and say, come on, let's open a lab, and let's do it with your own technology. Okay, well, we'll wait and see just how successful or otherwise their trial of their vehicles in Israel proves to be. It'll be uh, fascinating to see, and uh, I, for one, I'm all in favor of uh, electric cars. So I think that would be good if it works, and we'll find out soon enough. But we're coming towards the end of our time. It's flying, but there's just one more story I want to go to, uh, which was um, picked up by Yediot uh, Achronot, by ynet.co.il which is about the uh, fact that the uh, German, uh, Germany is freeing up a large amount of money uh, for Holocaust survivors to help support them uh, in the midst of this pandemic that we're all uh, struggling with uh, at the moment. Now, they're talking about some very big figures here, about a, a half a billion euros to aid Holocaust survivors in Israel, where so many live, but also around the world. Now, obviously, uh, that's a good thing. I'm just wondering if you have any views on the way that the Holocaust survivors are treated here in Israel, uh, that so many of them find themselves in poverty uh, at this point and having to still rely on handouts. I'll go to you first, Rami. What about this situation? I feel very, very awkward about it. I think that is such a shame. Anyone who survived the Holocaust, if he was a little child, you could not do any of that. It's a big shame for the country that I cannot just put him in a special category. And uh, regarding the German side, it's uh, amazing that after so many years, they still find ways how to try at least to compensate the survivors of uh, the terrible Holocaust. And uh, last time I was in Germany, I went to one of the uh, sites of the Holocaust. And I was very impressed with the fact that all the signs, all the tourist uh, explanation, were all in German, because it was meant for the German people. It wasn't meant for tourists like me. And uh, it's something that's too big for me to understand, but it's a big, big shame that Holocaust survivors, if they reach their 70s and 80s like they have, cannot live a very comfortable and quiet and peaceful life. That is sad. Boss? Uh, uh, less and less people are uh, from the Holocaust time, from the 40s, of course. Now we're speaking about the second generation. I don't, I, I don't know into details how they're going to locate the people and to, you know, to, to find out exactly who is uh, in the criteria and out of the criteria. I think and those are established, to be fair. I think they know pretty much who are Holocaust survivors. So I think we will we'll get to those that we should. Yeah, I count on them more than I count on us in this uh, issue. Uh, but then, but then, 
uh, the big issue, and I, I should say thank you to, to whom, to whom uh, who tried to, to support this, those people, but the issue is how will they get the money? Is it going to be a direct uh, transaction from the German gov government? The answer probably will be not, no. They, they have to go to a foundation in Israel. Yes, it tells you the claims conference. The claims conference receive a, a, a large sum of money from the Germans and then they distribute it uh, to the people and that uh, what, need what to the, the claim foundation or the claim company is one of the best names ever because everybody claim on them and they're not claiming to, to other people. In the last years, I know a big, big, big story made by Oli and Guy a few years ago about the money that people should get and the money was evaporated yeah. or disappeared. So this is the story and if they will get to the right people at the end of the day, second generation and even third generation and help them, God bless. Okay. Rami, anything to add to that? Uh, they're dispersing the funds that you mentioned over two years. And yes. the people are with their 80s, two years, say no more. Two years is a very long time when you're in your 80s and 90s, yeah. that's for sure. Well, I certainly hope the money gets to them as fast as possible. I know that amongst the Russians, who are Holocaust survivors, of course, they had far less access to documentation in order to make their claims during the times of the communist era. And they're the ones that so many of them have been left behind. And amongst the Holocaust survivors in Israel, a, a large number of the Russian and former Russian Republic Holocaust survivors are the ones who were struggling most. I've written about this a bit in the past. So I really do hope that the money gets to them as soon as possible. But uh, that's all we have time for this week. I want to thank very much both Boaz Corporal and Rami Lador for their contributions. It's been fascinating to hear their views on the range of subjects this week. Uh, we'll be back again next week with another look at what the Israeli papers say. But for the time being, from myself, Paul Alster, I'll say goodbye and hope you'll join us again for the next edition. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.